morning. The next case is um, Siegel versus Resource Technology Corporation. This is a 20 minute <coughs> mini oral argument on the application. That means, Ms. Gordon, you may try to reserve time, but we leave it to you to keep track of that, and you may begin whenever you're ready. Good morning, members of the court. Thank you. Uh, I would reserve three hours. Uh, I wish. <laughs> Three minutes. Denied. Denied. Very much denied. Start off bold. That's good. All right. Um, my, my case, as you are well aware, involves a, a public policy tort claim under Michigan uh, law. Uh, the Court of Appeals clearly um, was erroneous on their rulings as to several key points, as pointed out by Gl Judge Gleischer and her dissent. Let me far start with the very first one. Uh, and this comes up often in this area of the law. Uh, the court held that a mere complaint is not protected activity under public policy tort in the state of Michigan. Um, that is incorrect. There are several cases that we cite in our papers um, that uh, make clear, for example, under Watasik, where a nurse reported abuse of patients uh, and according to the court, he informed his supervisors. We hold that it was commonly contrary to public policy for an employer to discharge an employee in retaliation for reporting abuses uh, to patients. Landon versus Health Source. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff reported negligence in the form of malpractice in the context of a medical workforce. So there is clear case law out of uh, the Court of Appeals in Michigan that a complaint on its own is enough. Um, if that's in doubt uh, in front of you all, I would highly recommend in order to give some uh, cohesion to the law and to actually effectuate the purpose of public policy that you make that clear in your opinion. Um, doing a lot of this area of the law, I do see the courts are oftentimes confused about the three prongs of Sajidowski and what falls under what. Uh, Sajidowski is not an exhaustive list per Sajidowski of all the ways one can garner protection under the public policy tort uh, concept, um, but they do uh, list you know, several things, exercise of a right guaranteed by law, employees uh, refusal. Good morning, um, Counselor. In the lower courts, you didn't rely on uh, a theory that plaintiff was exercising a right. So tell me why we should even entertain that theory now. I'm not saying you should. Um, what I'm saying is two things, um, Justice Clement. I'm saying, number one, um, as the Court of Appeals latched onto, my client made a complaint. But it's absolutely clear under much case law in this state that failure to acquiesce in a violation of the law is actionable. Refusal or failure to acquiesce in the law. That comes up everywhere. Uh, look at... Um, uh, the Silverstein case. Um, I don't know that we, we cited it, but it's a Court of Appeals opinion um, saying that um, uh, failure to acquiesce in violations of the law are absolutely prohibited. And let me tell you for a bit about what my client did, because I've said from the beginning of this case, while it's easy to just say he complained, if you look at what Cleveland Stegall did, he put FCA to an awful lot of trouble. Uh, he wrote emails, he demanded air tests, he refused to go up to the penthouse, he uh, sought respiratory equipment and other PPE. Um, when he didn't get results, he swung back to his employer and asked where are the test results, where are the air quality results, which he never obtained from them. Um, so uh, even if a mere complaint, which should be a significant point as a matter of public policy, is not enough, we have a very clear-cut failure to acquiesce. The defendant in this case does not address that. The defendant in this case says there was simply a complaint, and that's just wrong. Um, so my point is that I have a failure to complain and I have, excuse me, a complaint and a failure to acquiesce in. Um, Counsel, if we were to agree with you that an internal report um, is enough to satisfy um, a public policy claim, is there some, some um, limitation to that? Does it have to be reasonable? I mean, is any internal complaint, even if it's kind of like absolutely not supported by any evidence, does it have to be, is there some level of reasonableness? Absolutely. I mean, good faith applies to all of these complaints. Judge Gleischer and her dissent made very clear 
that my client's concerns were extremely logical, that he saw the asbestos warning signs in the penthouse, literally saying warning hazardous asbestos. He saw the dirt on his shoes. They developed symptoms. Uh, blood was coming up, sore throat, coughing. It's all laid out in the brief. So my client was not just waltzing in somewhere and uh, making an idle complaint. This was a long-term series of events that occurred based on his actual being in the penthouse and seeing what was happening. And it wasn't just him. It was two other colleagues that also complained. But my client saw it through. He followed up. He continued to swing back. Um, all of these statutes, the whistleblower statute, the Elliott Larson Civil Rights Act, they all required a good faith complaint. And there would be no different here. And there is actually law that talks about, in the cases I've cited to you, that the uh, plaintiff made a complaint in good faith. So what are we to do about the fact that these were obviously safety-related complaints? We know MIOSHA and OSHA cover that purview. Um, why is your client's remedy not under those statutes? Okay, there is no remedy under those statutes. So let me make that very clear. Um, the defendants make really a half-hearted um, argument in this regard. Uh, OSHA provides a statutory prohibition against discharge in retaliation for the conduct at issue, but it does not provide a remedy. Uh, OSHA is the exclusive remedy, Your Honor, uh, for OSHA violations, not for retaliation. And defendant cites to nothing saying that OSHA would preempt this. Uh, with regard to my OSHA, my client did file a my OSHA complaint, and um, they found that there was no my OSHA violation. Uh, they did not take it up and take the next steps. There is nothing um, in either OSHA or my OSHA that provides a private remedy and says that we preempt all private causes of action and um, that we have adequate remedies for you. So I don't know if you have any further questions on that, but it, this, this was really a very half-hearted attempt by a defendant in their um, later briefs to suggest that OSHA does preempt, but they don't cite to anything. Um, well, to be fair, the Sikodolsky court cites the OSHA statu statute. I'm sorry, Your Honor. I, I said, to be fair, the, the Sikodolsky right. uh, court does cite OSHA as, you know, sort of in this first category of, of exceptions, right, along with Elliot Larson's and, exactly. and that. And so, so is that just, I mean, are we to take from that that they're that's a, a recognition by the Sokodolsky court that there is a similar provision, an anti-retaliation provision in OSHA, but that doesn't necessarily mean, like it might in a WPA or an Elliot Larson's claim, that that would be an exclusive remedy exactly. for that category. I, I think that's an excellent <coughs> example. Nowhere do they say that this is the exclusive remedy. It's just that the, the statute provides an anti-retaliation provision. Absolutely. And these statutes, OSHA and MIOSHA, my OSHA, are rightly the exclusive remedy if somebody is trying to stamp out uh, asbestos in the workforce. We're not here to do that. Uh, so uh, the, OSHA, the whole underpinning of a public policy tort, the whole underpinning is that you have to point to a law that was violated. You have to be able to say, I'm not arguing with you, Mr. Employer, about your ethics or my personal opinion of your accounting practices. Rather, Mr. Employer, I'm here to say that there is a law in the state or the federal government that you were in the process of violating, and I'm here to tell you I'm either complaining about it or I'm failing to acquiesce in it. And that is the, absolutely the heart and soul of public policy tort. And you need to look at it as a corollary to the Whistleblowers Protection Act. Because what we have in the state right now, I, th I think we need more emphasis on public policy tort. We have a clear-cut statute that any employee that goes to the government, even if they're wrong, if they go in good faith, if they go outside the employer walls, they go to the government and they report their employer, they are 100% protected. What sense does that make when the best uh, remedy is the first step to go to your own employer and to say to them, um, you know, you're violating the law here. I don't think you're, what you're doing is right. And try to resolve it internally. Well, don't even, the cases suggest that if you're, if the employer is a governmental employer, that even internal complaints to that internal governmental employer are still covered by WPA. That's correct. If you are a governmental employee and you make any report at all, just say, for example, my client's exact facts were that he worked for the state of Michigan or some local municipality would be a better example, and he went there, he would have 100% protection. 
So I really think this court, it would be very, very instructive for the state and helpful if we all understood in the state of Michigan, and these claims are hard for judges at uh, circuit, the circuit level to figure out how whistleblower works with public policy tort, to clarify the public policy tort should track um, should track whistleblowers and protect people who do their best to point out violations of the law to their employer or refuse to acquiesce in violations of the law. And it shouldn't be two different standards. You have to jump through 10 extra hoops if you try to deal with it internally. The concept of public policy in Michigan would work best, as we say in our brief, if people did feel comfortable going to their employer. Let's work it out before it gets to the point where I have to go blow the whistle. And that's what my client was doing here. He finally threatened, listen, I'm going to go to OSHA. Um, because you guys, I keep telling you, and you gave me PPE, and then you took it away from me. It was a matter of frustration for him. He wanted FCA to resolve it. And then he threw that out. So I, I, I have just a couple of other points I want to make. And I don't know if you're interested in them, or they seem clear. Uh, Council, can I ask you to address um, causation? Why is sure. there a tribal? question of fact regarding causation and what's the framework that I'm supposed to be analyzing causation under? I, I'm causation as to the temporal proximity? Yeah, tell me how I should think about the, the, the causation question here. Okay. Um, the Court of Appeals itself did find as a matter of law that um, my client made out the elements um, with regard to his claim. Um, that he, they acknowledge that the end of my client's assignment, the termination, um, was a question of fact. I mean, was he terminated, was he not? But the Court of Appeals made a really significant mistake in, in saying without any attribution to the law um, that I didn't have enough for causal connection because of this one or two week temporal proximity. And that's just flatly wrong. There are many cases which we cite where temporal proximity is 100% enough because if the time framing is so close and no other events have occurred between the day of the complaint by the employee or the report by the employee and the termination, nothing else has occurred. There's clearly the opportunity for a causal connection in the closeness in proximity. And that is exactly what happened here um, with Brightwing, where the, a week after they found out about the OSHA complaint, my client was out. At that time, he had an excellent track record with Brightwing. All of his performance reviews were good. They actually said, we're going to look for other jobs for you. And then, you know, he's terminated. Um, but, there's, but there's this evidence of, of other, um, other, you know, non reasons unrelated to his complaints um, that they claim uh, were, were justified the, the termination, and then there were the other two employees who also complained and were not terminated. They, how, do, they, how are we supposed to think about okay, that? Okay, well, the, the other two employees complained in a very minimal way. You, you see no emails in the record from the other employees. I think they, they were afraid, and this is what, of course, happens in the workplace. My client picked up the ball and ran with it. He's the one that did the emails. So set those aside for a second. When you say there are other things, on a good day for defendant, that's a question of fact. Those other things are very, very uh, scanty on any true evidence. Um, I cite in my brief a reference letter my client was given from one of the FCA bosses saying what an excellent employee he was. His personnel record is 100% clean. So with regard to any, I mean, that, that's going to get done. I didn't mean re related to his performance. I meant um, related to the economic, you know, the discontinued production oh, okay. of the sedan. You know, sure. I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't mean to. Well, okay, so the answer to that is that's a question of fact. And it's uncontested. The defense witnesses literally say, we intended to bring these three guys back. And then after the complaints, two of the three guys were brought back. And Cleveland Stegall was not brought back. And there was never any reason given. They just said, we don't have, uh, nobody has authorized or prove the expenditure for the third spot. Nobody said why it was Cleveland Stegall. That's got to be a question of fact. Can I, can I just have you clarify my understanding of, of sort of the, the different claims in that? Your contention is that you should, your client still has a viable public policy claim for the internal complaints to both FCA 
and right wing. And you have a, a separate, and, and you distinguish this of the complaint, you know, when he finally says, I, I'm going or I went to my OSHA, occurred after these, you know, that's right. not related necessarily to the, to the public policy. But you have a MIOSHA, relating to the MIOSHA claim, you have a whistleblower's protection claim against Brightmore only, correct? Right, so let me talk about that for a second. So they're different causation. That's exactly right. I just have to uh, point out one thing that I think is very important to my argument and shows how disingenuous the defendant is. They are about to argue to you, just as they argued to the trial court, uh, that the Whistleblowers Protection Act preempted this claim. That was their entire argument to Judge Anderson at the Oakland County Circuit Court. They paid virtually no attention to the public policy tort claim. Uh, and that was a procedural uh, unfortunate series of events because I came back and said when they argued preemption by whistleblower, I came back and said, you're right. As it turns out, I came in here hoping and wishing this was a whistleblower. But once I got your emails and I saw my client was fired before he ever said, I'm going to OSHA, I get it. I'm not arguing that anymore. It would be dishonest and a non-starter. But yet they continue to argue this whistleblower's thing when their own clients admit that the decision was made prior to the alleged uh, report that he was going to OSHA. Um, I don't see how the defendants can argue on the FCA side that my claim is preempted by the Whistleblowers Protection Act where they clearly say I don't have a Whistleblowers Protection Act claim. They clearly say that. And they say it because just as is correct, based on their discovery, they had already made the decision. So there is no way the Whistleblowers Protection Act covers FCA. Let's talk now about Brightwing. My client, they're the agency, of course, that does the paperwork. And after Cleveland Stegall was fired, he was very upset, obviously. And he went to Brightwing, which is the offboarding and the onboarding and the paperwork people, and he told them exactly what happened. And he then went and filed a MIOSHA complaint and named them. That's whistleblowing, members of the panel. That's the distinction. Now he's taken a step outside of the internal process of making a complaint or of failing to acquiesce, and he's gone to my OSHA, to my OSHA and he names both of, both of them. Chrysler's not included in that FCA, uh, or St Stellantis. Um, is not included in that because the decision, the die was already cast before he went to Myosha. But Brightwing, right after that, after the, he goes to Myosha, they then give him paperwork offboarding him and saying, good luck to you in the rest of your endeavors. Now, they're gonna get up and argue, Brightwing's gonna argue that he wasn't really terminated. I'll remind you that the Court of Appeals said they thought there was enough to show, certainly, that there was a strong argument that he had been terminated. Um, so that's what they're going to argue. But the fact is, in our version of the facts, which you must accept in the light most favorable to us, in that this is just on the pleadings, he was terminated from Brightwing. And he was terminated from Brightwing in very short order after he literally named them in a Myosha complaint. So yes, as to Brightwing, it is um, Whistleblower Protection Act. And as to FCA, it is not Whistleblower Protection Act. I just don't have the facts to support it. I wish that I did. You've got about a minute and a half if you want to save it for rebuttal. I'll save that. Thank you very much, Justice Zara. Good morning, and may it please the court. Cynthia Filipovich appearing on behalf of the defendant FLE, FCA, U.S. LLC. <clears throat> Council, before you start, you all are splitting your time, and I'm going to ask you to manage that, if that's okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, yes, we are splitting our time equally. Thank you. Plaintiff's employment with FCA ended because the plant in which he worked was being closed down due to the discontinuation of the Chrysler 200 model, and for no other reason. It was simply a reduction in workforce. And there are three reasons, alternative reasons, why this court can deny the application for leave to appeal. 
The first is that plaintiff indeed has filed a WPA claim against FCA and his claim regarding the WPA must focus on the conduct that he alleged. When asked in his deposition, point blank, why were you terminated? And this is when FCA was deposing him. Plaintiff responded, the nail in the coffin is when I went to OSHA. In Rivera, this court said there was no evidence that the plaintiff herself was about to report a suspected violation of law under the WPA, but rather that she wanted the defendant to so report and upset, was upset when it would not. The court recognized there is a legally significant distinction between being about to report a suspected violation of law and merely wanting someone else to do it. In light of that distinction, this court held that Rivera's public policy claim was not preempted by the WPA. In this case, by way of plaintiff's own deposition testimony, again, when asked, why were you terminated by FCA? Quote, the nail in the coffin is when I was said, I'm going to OSHA. But doesn't the evidence from your client suggest otherwise? Your Honor, if you're, if you're referring to the fact that we had made the decision to terminate not only plaintiff, but everyone at that plant, at the Sharp, at Sharp plant, because of the discontinuation of the Chrysler 200. If, if that's the decision to which you're referring, it's not the conduct of FCA, it's the conduct of what the plaintiff alleges. I would, and in this case, all the timing does to Justice McCormick's point is show that there's no causation. So while the conduct he alleges, I'm going to OSHA, that's a WPA claim. The fact that we made the decision to terminate him and everyone else in the reduction of workforce prior to him making that statement simply shows there's no causation. It doesn't change the fact that the conduct at issue is that under the WPA. And if I may, I would direct the court's attention to the case of Anzal Dua, which is cited in our brief, which is cited in the court's order in Rivera. In Anzal Dua, the plaintiff filed a public policy claim, claiming she was retaliated because she assisted uh, a DOL inspector uh, at, at the laboratory where she worked. When she filed this claim, the court says, we don't look at labels, we look at the conduct. And what is the conduct that you're alleging? The conduct that you're alleging falls squarely with the, within the four corners of the WPA. And that is where the employee is uh, retaliated against for participating in an investigation by a public body. So, there, so employees for private companies should always report, go straight to the government and report their concerns? Is that, does that make sense? What do, how do you respond to Ms. Gordon's argument that it, it, it's, not a, it's, it's probably not the best outcome that our court's doctrine encourages people who work for private companies to always go directly to the government instead of bringing their complaints to their employer to have them resolved? Um, I think two points to that, Your Honor. First, um, the court does allow, our case law does allow for internal complaints to be enough. But those internal complaints have to meet one of the three prongs of Sokoldowski. In the Landon case that um, uh, counsel relied upon this morning, there was a specific Michigan statute that says if you, as a nurse, as was in Landon, if you go and complain that there's 
one of your coworkers has committed malpractice and you complain about that, you're covered. You don't need to complain to a public body. So you can have internal complaints, but those internal complaints, as Sokoldowski enumerates, has to fall into one of those exceptions. And one of them is that an employee can't be discharged for exercising a right conferred by law, right? And federal regulations say that employees can raise concerns with their employers about potential asbestos exposure and they can't be retaliated against for raising those complaints. So why isn't that exactly what the public policy tort would, would, would protect? That actually goes to my second point, awesome. Justice Sorry McCormick. I'm, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> no, no, that, that it, it, it actually dovetails very nicely because we can't forget about this court's decision in Dudzowitz. What did Dudzowitz tell us? If there is a statute that provides a remedy, that statute controls. We've also had case law from this court uh, espousing the admonition that we have to be very careful about expanding upon the three narrow exceptions of Sokoldowski. And that's exactly what the what's being at this court is being asked to do this morning. Counselor, you, what statutes provide the remedy in this case? For, for uh, the WPA, it is MCL 15. Right, so. And for, I'm sorry, but you Right, like? I was gonna say, so we know from Rivera that if, um, if, um, you know, the plaintiff is not covered by the WPA, then potentially a public policy claim might exist. So I'm assuming that leaves Myosha then. But again, I was fired because I'm going to, I said I was going to OSHA. That's the, that's the plaintiff's own deposition testimony. We can't ignore that. To the extent we want to look at the OSHA statute, or excuse me, regulation, it would be 29 CFR 1977.9 subsection C. And to the extent that there may not be a private cause of action, this adequacy of the remedy, the case that um, plaintiff relies upon for this adequacy of the remedy is the case of Pompeii, which in Lash versus Traverse City, this court expressly stated no, it's not the adequacy of the remedy. We don't look at whether the remedy is adequate. What we look at is if there's a remedy and Dudzowitz tells us if there's a specific statute, that's the end of the story, covering the conduct at issue. The conduct at issue in this case, I was terminated because I said I was going to OSHA. And that's the conduct that is. Um, what do you? What, how do you address um, Sister Council's argument that that this distinction is made? I was terminated wrongfully under the WPA by Brightwing for saying I'm going to OSHA, and I was terminated in violation of public policy by both Brightwing and, and FCA for the internal complaints. The separation between, I agree, I mean, there's, there's the very rare case where you have sort of a, a factual distinction between the two. So how do you address the fact that she's saying, look, at, I, I, I was hoping there was a, a WPA claim against FCA, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it because the decision was made prior to, regardless of, of whether <coughs> Mr. Stigall thought that was, you know, the basis of his claim. But so there isn't a WPA claim against FCA. This is for the, the, the public policy is the internal complaints and the separate WPA claim against Bright Wing is for the I'm going to my OSHA. Um, Your Honor, I see that I'm past the 10 minute mark. Sure. May I answer your question sure. and so that my co-defendant is not penalized? Yeah. Thank you, Justice Kavanaugh. I think they're, they're, you're not getting more time, though. That's, <laughs> that's what you oh, no, I'm sorry. I was <laughs> no, I don't get to make time. that call, yeah. but feel free to answer the call or, or he can answer if you would prefer. Oh, I, OK, I'm sorry. Then I don't want to. Um, I 
I don't want to put Mr. Werner, but I want to answer your question. Very quickly, I think, again, it's the causation. What is the conduct that's being alleged? Why, what is he alleging against FCA? I'm going to OSHA. The fact that the decision has been made just goes to causation. Okay. It doesn't go to why. Okay. Um, thank you, and um, I'm sorry, no time for further questions. No problem, thank, thank you. you very much. We ask that you deny the application. <laughs> if we need more time with your co-counsel, we'll keep him up here, don't worry. We'll make sure we get all our questions answered. That's very nice of you guys. Uh, it may please the court, Tom Werner, appearing on behalf of uh, co appellee Resource Technology Incorporated, uh, DBA uh, Brightwing. Um, I want to start with the Whistleblower Protection Act claim against uh, Brightwing. Uh, I recognize that the court really requested mostly briefing on the public policy argument, but this is an important issue that's already come up a few times today, so it needs to be addressed further. Plaintiff has yet to state anything in any level of court beyond a mere timeline of events to establish the essential element of causation under the WPA. All he said about through this case is what he says again now. He reported to OSHA, Brightwing learned about that report, and then Brightwing thereafter either failed to find him another assignment or outright terminated him. This court has held in West versus General Motors, as this court is well aware, that, quote, a temporal relationship standing alone does not demonstrate a causal connection between the protected activity and any adverse employment action. And that's exactly what we have here is a temporal relationship standing alone. Even in this argument today, counsel for plaintiff has said that this termination happened in, quote, very short order. That's the only evidence that's on the record as to the, the causation or motive element. Um, what plaintiff has attempted to do in the briefing, which he never attempted to do at either the trial court or court of appeals, is to distinguish West by reference to Henry versus the City of Detroit, the 1999 court of appeals case, which West itself distinguished. In that case, the court of appeals found that the temporal relationship was supplemented with evidence, one, that Henry's superior expressed displeasure with Henry's exercise of his protected activity, and two, that the discipline imposed upon Henry by his employer was, quote, seemingly undeserved. Here, uh, Mr. Stigall's activity protected by the WPA, again, was his report to OSHA. There are no evidence, there's no evidence on the record at any level that shows that Brightwing ever expressed any displeasure with him going to OSHA. That doesn't exist. So that first additional piece of evidence under Henry, it, it's not there. And second, there's no evidence that the supposed discipline by Mr. Stigall, by Brightwing, of not finding an alternative of placement was in any way undeserved. Uh, about that point, I've got two quick notes. Kerry Kazanowski, who is the Brightwing employee who oversaw the contract between a Brightwing and uh, a Chrysler, said uh, that she continued to look for alternative assignments for Mr. Stigall after the OSHA report was but was unable to find any. That's in her deposition at page 47. And then she testified about the reasons that she couldn't find alternative assignments for Mr. Stigall. One, she said that Brightwing didn't have a strong foothold in the IT field because it didn't have an IT commodity as of May 2016. That's at page 88 of her deposition. And she said that when IT assignments did pop up, those assignments typically required a college degree, which Mr. Stigall didn't have. So this testimony is undisputed, and it establishes that there was no discipline of Mr. Stigall within Henry, and that their inability to find Mr. Stigall an alternative employment was not undeserved. It was a result of economic reality. But isn't that, and I'm struggling with this, what is, where does the prima facie evidence start and end? And where does your clients rebutting that prima facie case? I understand you're saying, look, we had a legitimate non-retaliatory motive for doing this, as you just said, your, your client testified and, and that. But we're talking about a prima facie case, right, of what the plaintiff has to basically, like, you know, be able to put in a complaint. I, I was employed, I was told I was gonna continue to be employed, I, you know, had a good, a good record, 
and um, I filed a MIOSHA complaint, and they fired me. That's, that's correct. That's the only prima facie evidence that they presented, which is that temporal relationship. They well, were, but, but the, f the first couple were more than just temporal, right? It was, it was that he was employed, he was told he was going to continue to be employed, and he had, there was no, at least, he's alleging there was no basis to say why he wouldn't be, right? I mean, that's prima facie, right? I understand your client, and maybe he couldn't get over the evidence that you're submitting to rebut the prima facie, but isn't that enough for prima facie? I don't think so, Your Honor, because the prima facie case actually requires proof of motive or causation, as it's stated, and that proof has to be more than just temporal where is, relationship. What is, where's the citation that says that it has to be motive? There has to be allegation of, or proof of motive to establish prima facie. Well, that's from, I'm pulling that from West versus General Motors where it says, again, a temporal relationship is not enough to establish the element of causation. So temporal is not enough, and therefore you need a motive as well to establish prima facie. Yeah, that's what about What about your uh, opposing counsel's argument of what do you do with the case that, you know, there is just, there is no gap. Like, there is nothing but temporal. I mean, then, and let's say it's, it's admitted it was straight up retaliation. I heard I was going to place him the next day. I heard he filed a MIOSHA complaint, and I fired him. Well, that would be a completely different scenario than what we have here. That would be a case where arguably there could be evidence of, of motive beyond just the temporal relationship. Well, sure, but I mean, obviously the plaintiff isn't going to know that issue. All they know is... I was, one day I was going to be placed and I was waiting for that phone call or email or whatever it is, and I filed a MIOSHA complaint and next day I'm fired. The, all, you, all the plaintiff would have in order again to do prima facie, I'm not saying they can get past that perhaps, but all they have is the temporal proximity because it wasn't like they hung, you know, they kept him around for another month to, you know, I don't know, whatever the reason may be. So what do you do when, when that is all that you have? You're saying it never can be enough. Or we've said, I guess, you're saying it never well, can be enough. Well, I think we're talking about two different things. I think you, you are talking, and correct me if I'm wrong, of course, but I think you're talking about actually pleading in a complaint. I think after that, you know, he, he can plead in a complaint that there's motive, but he has to prove that through discovery. And he has to present evidence at the summary disposition phase that there is some proof beyond a temporal relationship. And at the uh, summary disposition phase in this case, he presented no such proof because there was no such proof that was adduced during discovery. So we're talking about the difference between, I think, the pleading of the, of the elements and the actual proof of the elements that has to be adduced during discovery and then presented to the trial court at the summary disposition level. Um, and, and that just wasn't present. So, you know, I, I spent a, a bit of time talking about the WPA claim. I really want to address uh, briefly the public policy claim as it pertains to Brightwing. You know, uh, all of the reports and all of the actions that are alleged by Mr. Stegall all had to do with Chrysler. None of those actions were taken by Brightwing. And to try to hook Brightwing to those public policy arguments, the plaintiff has cited to a joint employer vicarious liability theory that has not been adopted by Michigan courts. The cases where the plaintiff <coughs> finds this joint employer theory, employer theory are all federal cases, and many are outside the Sixth Circuit. All those cases have one thing in common, regardless of where they came from. In order to find that a staffing agency such as Brightwing is a joint employer, plaintiff has the burden to prove that Brightwing and FCA had equal control over the decision-making processes as to Mr. Stegall's employment. Here, that's just not true. You heard counsel for Mr. Stegall describe Brightwing as an onboarding, offboarding paperwork people. We didn't control the place where he worked. We didn't have access to SHEP. We couldn't conduct air quality tests. We couldn't demand access to air quality test results. There's just nothing here, and, and that vicarious liability theory, if it is adopted in this case, cannot apply to uh, um, right wing. Uh, and it, I'll answer any questions otherwise. Yeah, let me make sure if there people have additional questions before you sit down. Okay, thank you, thank counsel. You. Thank you. Um, let me address the uh, last argument first, this temporal proximity. 
let me put that to rest. Um, citing to Taylor versus Modern Engineering, 252 Mishap, 655, quoting Town versus Bell Telephone, 455 Mish, uh, 688. Close timing between alleged protected activity and the termination of a plaintiff's employment may establish the causal connection element of a plaintiff's prima facie case of retaliation and the proofs offered in support of the prima facie case may be sufficient to create a triable issue of fact that the employer's stated reason is a pretext as long as the evidence would enable a reasonable fact finder to infer the employer's decision had a discriminatory basis, here retaliatory. Um, clearly, this is a question of fact. Clearly, the closer in time, the more obvious the pretext is as was just pointed out by the panel. Um, the facts here are that my client complained to my OSHA on July 6th. On July 14th, Brightwing became aware of the complaint. They were notified. And on August 3rd, for the very first time, uh, they communicated to Cleveland's de Gaulle he was no longer employed with the agency. They provided no reason. And to this day, they've done nothing for him to get him another job, even though they try to suggest they might. What's their motive there? Their motive is FCA is a huge important client to them. There is, that's their motive. And the, Moshe, the Myosha claim coupled with we're getting rid of him because this is a big client of ours and he's now sued us and the company for Myosha, we're done with him. It's a question of fact for the jury. Let me go back to- um, Counsel, let me ask a question sure. on, on the preemption uh, issue. Maybe that's what you were gonna talk about, but I just wanna make sure I understand your position your, is it your position that there is no, um, there's no claim under MIOSHA uh, for this type of retaliatory discharge, or is it your claim that the, uh, the, the claim that is available is not adequate? Because it appears under 408, MCL 408.10652 that there is a, a claim for discharge um, for asserting your rights under my OSHA that includes rehiring or reinstatement. Right. Um, it actually says order all appropriate relief, including rehiring, reinstatement, um, and back pay. So is it, I'm just trying to sure, let me, dial in on I what agree. the argument is. I agree, got right here, I hear, I know what you're talking about. Um, it does say that retaliation is illegal. It does give, give you an opportunity to make an administrative complaint. Uh, Justice Viviano does not say it's the exclusive remedy. My client did go to my OSHA, please keep that in mind and he named FCA. But from a, from a preemption standpoint, this public policy claim that you're making, it, I just want to understand, your, your, so you're not saying there isn't another statutory claim that covers this. You're saying that it's not an adequate remedy? Is that No, the I'm saying that the classic public policy toward claim is when there is a law in the state of Michigan that says, for example, as here, you cannot retaliate against someone for uh, making a complaint under OSHA. That's kind of black letter law. If the employer does retaliate against, against you in violation of this act, or in our brief, we argue more to OSHA uh, and, and the asbestos law, but there's a law right here that says you can't retaliate. So this takes us to one of the other prongs, I think that one of the other justices mentioned, where there's a clearly established right not to be retaliated. This statute actually works in my But are there favor. cases that say that you're claim is then limited to what the legislature Absolutely provided. not. Absolutely not. I have not okay. seen that. Um, the one place that applies is uh, workers' comp, uh, although even in workers' comp, where they, they've added a retaliation provision, Justice Viviano, in later years, um, that you can't retaliate. But we still bring those cases as public policy torts. So um, Myosha does provide administrative remedy if one chooses to avail himself of it. But the key in order to be preempted is something must be the exclusive remedy. It's, you cannot say this is illegal uh, and make it the exclusive remedy. It's, for example, Elliot Larson says it's illegal to retaliate against somebody and you can come with us and file a complaint. So I think the case he opposing counsel cited was due to it and it sounds like you disagree with his I certainly do. I do do what says no case. such thing. I'd be happy to pull that out if you want to talk more about it. But I, I think you get my point. I mean, th there's. They give us access to those cases. I know. I, I there's. I think you do. Somewhere. I think you do. There's zero 
argument from the defendant giving you all language saying, and here's why it's exclusive. It makes no sense. Let's think about this. Cleveland Seagal is subjected, subjected to asbestos. He goes to the company. They pay no attention. He goes to OSHA, my OSHA. Did they find asbestos in the plant? They, well, the company only looked at pictures and said no. Apparently, after he was gone, we've been told by the company that they found nothing. And I think that's what my OSHA reflects. They didn't find any actual asbestos in spite of the signs. So what, in, in, in the um, example you're giving me, a employee would be completely left high and dry because he's complained internally, nothing has happened. He now goes to my OSHA, and they do, even though he's been fired, and they do nothing for him. So he has zero remedy. Well, but you're, I mean, that sort of builds in the assumption that the administrative proceeding concluded that your client didn't have a meritorious claim, aren't you? I mean, is no, that wasn't an administrative proceeding. That was one investigator that went up to the penthouse and looked around. My client was never called in. He was never given an opportunity for a hearing. Did he there make this claim under this section of MIOSHA that he should be reinstated? And ask for a reinstatement? He made, I doubt it. I think he made a, well, that's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I, I hate to say I'm unsure, but he went to my OSHA and filed a claim about the company being uh, in violation of their own statute. But he and never, he, he said, never, he never I was fired. A, he never asserted a retaliation claim under my OSHA. He said, I was fired. I did. Reinstatement and back pay, right? He did make a claim, nothing ever came of it. They dropped it, which is not unusual. Let's face it, with an agency like MyOSHA, they're not gonna run down every rabbit hole because somebody says he was fired and they did nothing. But then presumably he would have some appellate rights, right? No, they, that is not so and that's not in this document. I, and this is a very um, uh, simplistic, I mean, I, I appreciate they say you can't retaliate, but the MyOSHA regs are hardly uh, comparable to a Whistleblowers Protection Act claim or a public policy tort claim I, where somebody actually has rights under Michigan but that, law. That starts to sound like adequacy, right? You're not, the legislature I'm, covered this, but you're not satisfied with the adequacy of the remedy. That absolutely, the remedy is not adequate, and that's one of our very key arguments. Okay. So that is absolutely correct. And even defendant does not point to anything like that. Okay, um, counsel, you're way over time. You're Please okay. Conclude. Yes. Can I just say one thing about this nail in the coffin argument that was made by FCA about the depth testimony? If you speak um, really that quickly. is complete. I'm sorry. If you speak really quickly, I will. That is complete red herring. Here is the testimony. Um, he said, um, "It was like everything was accumulated in a big snowball effect." When I, I know when I spoke to Jim dealing with results, he had no answer, and then everything kind of led up to a snowball effect. The thing I know is that when Jim came back, I was asking for these results. I know he's going to Rick because he said he hasn't gotten them yet. I don't mind saying I was probably irritating him for asking. I thought that the OSHA complaint was the nail in the coffin. He thought that at the time. It turned out he was wrong. They'd already decided to terminate him. Defense counsel totally mistakes the law on that point. That does not make it a whistleblower's claim. It cannot be a whistleblower's claim if the decision to fire him had already been made, period. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you both. The case will be submitted. We're going to take a short break and we'll be back in 15 minutes.